This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now I am so fucking excited for today's guest because she's a part of my childhood. She's been on my bucket list for a long time. I didn't think it was going to happen, but it's going to happen today. I will be talking to Rhonda Shear. Yes, Rhonda Shear, the host of USA Up All Night. Oh my god, this is where my love of exploitation film started. Rhonda, of course, is a stand-up comedian, very funny. She's um, currently hosting a uh, show called The Rhonda Shear Social Hour on YouTube. She's a lingerie mogul. She uh, has a book out called Up All Night, From Hollywood Bombshell to Lingerie Mogul, Life Lessons from an Accidental Feminist. And she's been in some cult movies, Galaxina, Basic Training, Mel Brooks Spaceballs, the uh, Rollerblade 7 movies, and Frogtown 2 with Donald G. Jackson, and so many others. And it's going to be a great conversation today. When I was growing up, there were no more horror hosts. It was Gilda, it was, it was... Rhonda on Friday night, Gilbert on Saturday night, on USA Up All Night, and Joe Bob Briggs on TNT Monster Vision. That was it during my childhood. There were no more horror hosts. So I'm like a kid in a candy store. She's like, a, she's like the President of the United States to me in this matter. This is how much it means to me. And I'm just so excited. I mean, oh my God, Hollywood Chainsaw Hookers, Weekend Pass, Beverly Hills Vamp, um, Chopping Mall... Oh my god, uh, Night Patrol, so many great movies I, I love that I've chronicled on this show. I, it all started with me watching them on USA Up All Night, so it's going to be a real honor for me. So yeah, here is my interview with Rhonda Shear. Hey Rhonda, welcome to the show, how are you today? I am fine. I am just great. How are you? I am just spectacular. Um, for th- thirty years, I've been waiting for this tremendous honor because if it wasn't, <laughs> if it wasn't for you and Gilbert, I wouldn't love low budget movies like I do. So, thank you for taking the time today. I'm so excited, um, and I so appreciate that. You know, the more I hear this from people like yourself that grew up with me, it just it blows my mind that I feel completely honored. I really do, because um, I was talking to uh, um, my wonderful podcast yesterday, and it was actually uh-huh. for the Chattanooga Film Festival, and the gal that interviewed me said very similar things, and, you know, that she was nervous to speak to me, and I said, wow, I know that feeling, because when I met Barbara Eden, that's how I felt, because I grew up loving I Dream of Jeannie, and, yeah. but anyway, it's, it's, it's a great honor for me as well, so thank you. Oh, my pleasure. So, Let's begin with your book, USA Up All Night, From Hollywood Bromshell to Lingerie Mogul, Life Lessons from an Accidental Feminist. What made you want to write a memoir? I just had so many stories, and not just the stories of Hollywood, but I also wanted to talk about finding or refinding, you know, real love um, after 40 and then starting a new career after 40 and then, you know, a successful career in another, in a completely other field, but right. still keeping my foot in the world I love, which is show business. So that's what I wanted. I had so many stories that I still, even with the book, didn't, <laughs> didn't scratch the surface. Yeah. Um, but it's, I just had to get it out. You know, all these memories were in my head and, and I'm actually, just the whole idea of being an accidental feminist, I think people, a lot of people in my life thought that the Up All Night character, which I created, unfortunately, I used my own name instead of another name, uh, um, like Elvira, you know, Sandra Peterson using Elvira, like people, it was a distinct difference that she was playing Elvira, as opposed that I just wanted to get my name out there, so I kept Rhonda Shear, and so people thought I was, which I, it wasn't a bit, but if you listened, it was smart stuff, but, you know, but the whole idea was to keep people tuned into these movies, and so the sexy image is what H is. I mean, rather, you know, I just found my new network, but um, but USA Network won it at the time. Um, anyway, it was it was a great ride, and I wanted to get those those points out in the book that you know I had more going on in my brain than maybe some people thought. You know, that yeah. might have just tuned or passed the show and never really listened. So just my own thing that I think I felt like I had to get it out and I'm really glad I did you know and it's yeah. actually still being shopped around or still I mean it was 
somebody in LA wanted to make a movie out of it and is still running with it. And we've had, we've come so close. Um, so I, I think at some point it'll hit. There's so much, there's so much content needed out there. And what's great is the backdrop of the book is a lot of it from my early days is, you know, great 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, the early 2000s. So I think it's kind of a fun time, um, well, also an interesting time. It was pre Me Too movement, so a lot of that comes to light in my book. Uh, how we had to struggle through those days and how I how I navigated it personally. So it's a good book. A lot of pictures in it as well, and I'm very proud that I did it. Got it off my chest. <laughs> <laughs> how long did it take to write? Oh my gosh! Well, I would start with it, and then I would stop. So about two years. Um, I'd get onto these writing sprees, and then I, then I would just burn out, and then I'd go months and, and not touch it, and then I would pick it up, and then, so, um, you know, not ever writing, you know, writing my own material and stand-up through the years, but not writing a book was just a whole different, you know, uh, task for me, so, but it was great, it was fun, and it was, like, very cathartic, and just, it was just great to, to, to go back and revisit a lot of these these moments, and it also made me think of certain moments in my career that either things that I did wrong, which there's nothing to do about that, or things that happened to me that I never realized that didn't go right that wasn't my fault. So it just made me kind of open my eyes. You know, sometimes, you know, you go through life and you shut things off. On the other hand, you also learn by these life lessons. So all good. Yeah. Did you have to dig deep into your psyche archives to find stuff that you forgot all about? You know, it's really funny because I have, oh, I used to keep, not diaries, I never like wrote, oh, and today I did this and that, but I used to keep um, books, you know, just to keep my dates. So mm-hmm. in those books, there's obviously a lot of names and dates and memories that would have stirred my brain, but for some reason, I still have problems going to open those books, so I never did that. So, no, it just kind of came out. Of, I do work with a ghostwriter, and it's so funny. I worked with him. I guess I'm hard to manage. I've been told that my whole career. Mm-hmm. I worked with this guy who was really good and just, you know, was really great. But when I saw what he rewrote of mine, I didn't like it, so then I turned it around <laughs> and literally rewrote every word that he wrote. And it was really good. Instead of, like, you know, getting really upset with it, he went with it. And then just added some things that I never thought about, like he added these points to the end of every chapter, and um, I thought that was really great. He kind of just, he kind of pulled in my thoughts, but but the words were all mine, so I love that. Um, I, I kind of needed to work with someone to kind of get it in order. It's really hard when you have so many stories because my life kind of each story kind of goes back to my mother or my childhood. So even if I feel like a movie or a TV show was ever made, it would have to revert back to certain periods of my life that has, you know, you know, literally is what has made me who I am. So a lot of, you know, going back to my childhood and my mom and my pageant days and Playboy, um, all of that takes part of my today's life. So I think there'd be a lot of, you know, recall to that if there was ever a, 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 a movie made. In the meantime, in a book, it's really hard for me to figure out how to do that. Like, how do I... And he did that. He worked on that. And that was like, you know, just getting those, those thoughts in an order that didn't make me sound completely out of my mind. <laughs> There's been a lot of great reviews on the book, and I'm really excited about it. And I want to do more with it. You know, I, I need to re-promote it. So thank you for talking about it. Absolutely. Is, is the book getting well-received? Totally well-received. And, you know, it's funny because a lot of, I think, you know, a lot of people read it and they think it's a silly story about Hollywood. Mm-hmm. And then they start going into things about my life today and my stuff on HSN Home Shopping Network and then reuniting with my husband who was my junior high school sweetheart and I, I think they're like, wow, well that gives me hope, you know. Yeah. Fine love. And you never give up you start a whole new career that's completely different from something you did earlier in your life. So you, you, you just have to keep that energy and like, you know, I I don't know if I could ever retire because I mm, as much as I always talk about that, I'd like to just sit around and do nothing. I really don't mean that. <laughs> I do it for a couple of days, and I'm like, okay, what's next? So, you know, I'm constantly in touch with my team. You know, I have a, a consignment store, too, which I love now, which, was, which my husband and I opened in the last two years. We basically did it for an investment you know, on a piece of property, and then I just love the world of consignment and circular buying and, you know, sort of things just getting thrown out forever. People rediscovering designer handbags and shoes, and, mm-hmm. and I love this business, so I'm constantly working on marketing with my team, and the same thing with, um, 
my own team for the Lawn to Share brand, my intimate apparel brand, constantly working and coming up. You know, social media changes so fast now, and it's so important in the world of retail that um, I stay very close to it. So I learn a lot as well. Oh, that's awesome. So going back in time, when, when you were hired for USA Up All Night, you were replacing Caroline Schlitt, uh, which I, vag- yeah. I vaguely remember her. But did, did you go into it expecting it to be like a short-lived gig and then it just exploded into this big thing? Oh, it was really funny. Um, I, I didn't know Caroline Schlitt. I didn't watch the show before, you know, being uh, my agent getting me an audition for it. But I did, of course, then do a little, little research and watched her to see what they were doing, and I, and I thought she was really good. <laughs> I mm-hmm. thought she was really pretty, so I was like, why are they replacing this girl? But they admitted they wanted, I think she was, like, she would be very current today. I thought she was ahead of her time. Yeah. And I think I was too, but she was ahead of her time in a different way. But um, she was snarky and sarcastic, and she was very good. I don't know why she never did stand up, but I never knew her. I never met her. I never met Carolyn, but, you know, I know people really loved her. But they really wanted to go overtly sexy and mm-hmm. I had been told in my career up to then I had done happy days and all these different shows and I was just told over and over uh, and I wanted to play other roles, other kinds of roles like the girl next door whatever that entails or the mom or whatever and I, I was told you can never do that mm-hmm. you can never do that and I was and I was fine you know I loved playing the roles like that but I wanted to expand and I started doing stand up thinking well that would let people see, you know, that, that I'm very well-rounded as an actress, and I'm funny. Anyway, um, I got so fed up with being told that you can only play a certain role that when I, when I went out for Up All Night, I just went for it. I went huge. I'm like, okay, if this is all I'm gonna, I can do and I keep getting typecast, then I'm going to go big with this because they said, oh, it's a host type. So a lot of women I know showed up, you know, as though they were auditioning as a newscaster, you know, back then suits and, you know, conservative dress. Um, that's yeah. not mine. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm on a podcast, Mom. That's not mine. Um, anyway, um, my husband was asking if I'm selling a handbag of ours that, yeah. you know, that you saw online. And it was, I'm like, that's not mine. Because I do like some of my handbags. He's like, they show up in the store. He's like, is that yours or selling? I'm like, no, that's not mine. Anyway, um, <laughs> getting back to Caroline. So they, I just went into the audition with something cut very low in the front, very low in the back, with a blow dryer in my hand. And I just went... <laughs> over the top huge and they loved it I mean it took like three months before I got cast you know so they kind of you know they sat on it or kept interviewing and I think that they just decided that they would you know go for it as well and then I sat in my kitchen with the director Tommy Lynch who was directing and producing the first year Mm -hmm. we went through a lot of directors and producers I don't know why because the show was great and was successful but they kept changing producers and directors Um, I think I had six or seven to my years there. But um, anyway, Tommy was the first one. I we sat in my kitchen and I said, you know, I want to come up with like a tagline that they'll remember. And I was one who came up with up all night. And <laughs> he liked it. And because um, I used to do a commercial back in New Orleans for a health spa. And my tagline then, it was a women's health spa. I was like, let's get in shape. So I was known always as the let's get in shape girl. So yeah. I just wanted to come up with something that was stick in people's minds. So all night, <laughs> and that's how it was born. <laughs> yeah, I was born in my kitchen in '91, and um, it, was just, it was just a great time in my life. You know, I'd done Playboy with all my clothes on, but you know, and that was kind of a wild era in my life uh, in New Orleans because I actually got dethroned as one of my titles that I held because I was a pageant girl back in the day. So, um, so you know, same kind of thing came into my mind. I was like, mm, well, you know what? I got in trouble with all my clothes on, so now it's 1991, and now no one's taking me seriously as a stand-up comic. This is right before um, up all night, and I said, "Well, I think I'm just going to go to Playboy and let them just pitch the idea of women of comedy." Mm-hmm. And so that's what happened. They loved it, and they so much so they were looking to do women of comedy on the Playboy Channel. But we ended up doing a layout in '91. Then right, well, actually, we did it, in, I guess we did it in 90, maybe. I can't remember exactly when it was, but what's funny is that Up All Night, I was casting Up All Night at that time, or right around that time, and then when Up All Night blew up, they came back to me and asked to do a, you know, a six-page layout, celebrity layout. So I was never a, a buddy or a playmate, but Playboy's been in my life, like, pretty much my whole life. 
for the better. It was really good. It was never a bad thing. So yeah. anyway, um, I, I think I was always going against. People would always say, you can't do this. You can't, you, you know, you're too pretty to be funny. Or Ugh. you can't do this way. And so and I heard all these no's my whole life. So every time I heard a no, I, I'm like, I'm opening that door. And I did. And, and even, well, I don't know to this day, but early on, um, um, What's her name? Oh my gosh, Jenny McCarthy gave yeah. me credit. She said, "Thank you. You opened the doors for pretty women to be able to be funny and silly." When you know, on her very first show, so I interviewed her on Up All Night, or you know, one of my very early on when she was just starting as well. So, so I feel like I did open that door early on for women. And now, you know, now I love it because it doesn't matter how people dress on stage or or who they are. It's, it's okay. But back then. It was not easily accepted. If you didn't like dress in jeans and kind of grungy, you couldn't be funny. And um, it was fun to open that door. I, I certainly think that you are a pioneer of that for sure. Um, yeah, I was seven and a half when you started doing the show, and quite frankly, I didn't even know I didn't even know the show until you came on. And my parents and I had a deal where if I was doing well in school, I could stay up late on the weekends and during the summertime. And on the weekends, you know, it was always USA up all night with me, you know. And initially, I started watching the show in hopes that you were going to get naked on there. But of course, being that young, you don't know any better than that. <laughs> And that's what was so fun about it. And we knew yeah. that. USA knew that. And we knew that we had a lot of young people. I didn't realize I had that young audience. But listen, my, my husband, yeah. my now husband, no, he was my only husband, but, you know, we were, again, reunited. So he used to watch the show with his young kids. So yeah. my stepson remembers many of Friday night watching Up All Night with his dad, and who was kind of sneaking a peek at his, his first plane, which I think is hysterical. But through the years, I've gotten... So many fun stories how they used to hide the portable TV under the sheets and they'd yeah. sneak out or they'd go to a friend's house and, um, you know, or their parents wouldn't let them watch it at all because I think the parents thought that it was showing much more. But the whole thing, what, what we did, what Gilbert and I both did was fill the time that USA Network cut out a film. So they cut out the language. They cut out the nudity of these films. So yep. sometimes we'd go as, much, as little as 10 to 12 minutes, and sometimes it'd be a 45-minute show, depending on the films and how much they had just cut out. USA never showed nudity or had language, but I think nope. the parents just saw these sexy little films and saw it. But it was kind of, that was kind of what I based my character on, too, was like leaving it to the imagination, like being very flirty, which I guess you can't do nowadays, but being very flirty and fun, but bringing it to the edge, but never going over it. So it was kind of a, more of a bit of an innocence, which I, you know, I loved about Marilyn Monroe and ladies that I uh, admired growing up. Um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of parents thought it was a lot more, because I think a lot of parents were watching as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you were really young. You were really young, uh, which was great, which was awesome. And it was, you know, I, I know that I gave a lot of people, a generation, a love of... Um, of the B-film genre. Yeah. USA was just trying to run these films and make money off of them, and they just, that's why they hired Gilbert and I just to, to hold them through the commercial breaks. So it was really amazing how well that show did. Made so much money for the network that it funded shows like Weird Science and La Femme Nikita mm -hmm. and allowed them to start doing, you know, and competing with the other networks. Um, I believe it's a little show that you know, they didn't pay, the executives didn't pay a lot of attention to, but drew in big bucks with advertisers. Yeah, I mean, all, all the movies I love, you know, I discovered from USA Up All Night, like Night of the Comet, um, Night Patrol, um, oh, God, yeah. all the Fred Olin Ray movies, like Hollywood Chainsaw Hookers and Beverly Hills Vamp oh, yeah. and The Tomb and, and Bad Girls from Mars. I've been very lucky I've become friends with Michelle Bauer. She says hi, by the oh. way. Love her. Love Michelle. I was looking at a picture of her with Linnea last night. Um, those girls were great. They were on my show all the time, and they were lovely. I actually did one, one film with them. And, you know, I was saying this to the young lady I was talking with yesterday, that I could have done so many films myself, but I was had my sights so set on the sitcom world mm -hmm. and the television world that I never went after it yet. You know, I met all these producers and directors, but I was like, eh. I didn't want it. I didn't care about those films. I didn't care about being in them. I mean, my career, I wanted 
to do is a legitimate comedy, but more sitcom, you know. It was just so funny. And I think back, wow, what a fool. I could have been in so many of those films, and they were so awesome. But it took me years to look back on on that as well. But here's the sad thing, or the sad or, or, you know, kind of sad thing, Mm -hmm. is that um, USA Network would send me copies of all the films to watch prior to the shows. And at one point, I owned every one of those films. Not that I could have made money off of them, nor would I have wanted to, but yeah. just to have had all those iconic films, I had the entire library, but, you know, I lived in an apartment, and at some point I had to, and then I started storing them, and then I, I got rid of them down the line. But here's the cool thing, mm-hmm. is that USA Network took all of my footage, all those years, I did over 400 and something shows, and Gilbert as well, it's Gilbert more than me, because he started two years before me. Uh-huh. Um, they took all those shows and erased them for the tape. <laughs> oh God! You would think so, you, you would think the days of Dick Cavett were over because a lot of his shows got erased. <laughs> all of those shows got erased, but here's what the cool part about it is: mm-hmm. I had in my contract that USA Network had to send me a copy. I've been really good about archiving like all my stuff mm-hmm. of every show, so I'm missing probably twenty to thirty shows somehow, just moving or whatever through the years, but. Slowly, I have been putting, um, I have people putting things up on YouTube, slowly putting, you know, every episode up, or at least parts of episodes. Not the whole movie, obviously, I don't own the rights to those films anyway, but just my part, you know, the, 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 the sketches. And um, I think that's been fine, you know, at least some of that's been preserved, so a lot of people are, are discovering up all night from YouTube. <laughs> Yeah, I'm so happy about that. You know, I'm a subscriber of your channel, and I'm glad you got all that stuff on there because I, I just, I look at it and I feel like I'm nine again. You know, it's just amazing. Uh-huh. That's so awesome. No, I know. I'm so glad that I did that. I mean, I, I just think it's fun to preserve anyway. I mean, I've had so many people go, "Wow, just looking at the old commercials from back then, or a lot of the other shows I've done." You know, um, whether it be Up All Night or Happy Days, you know, yeah. converting them and then coming across. Uh, a lot of it was just taped off of air, but coming across, um, you know, old commercials or what have you at the time. It's just fun to look back on television from, from different years back. So, yeah, we've been trying to put up as much as we can, and my team started a YouTube, I mean, except TikTok. So far, I haven't done any live or as many current things, but they've been putting up little pieces of, um, or little, you know, um, scenes from different shows and up all my just different shows. So that's been fun. And it's actually getting, you know, slowly building up nice viewership. <laughs> yeah. That's why you're coming to this world of today. Here's an interesting question. When you and Gilbert were showing all those movies, you know, they were brand new at the time and fresh. But now they're considered classics. But it seems like right. all the horror hosts and streaming doesn't show them. And I think it's because of the PC cancel culture and just how gratuitous they are in nudity and violence and all of that. What do you make of that? I think it's horrible. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I just think it's horrible. I mean, I think so many things have blown me away. Listen, I understand the whole Me, me Too thing, and I'm all about that with women, but also I navigated it and came out unscathed. I mean, I might have lost a mold, but I didn't go meet people in their hotel room for auditions. Mm-hmm. So, you know, a lot of that is also, you know, happened because of women also going, uh, women and men, going as far as they would because they wanted to, they would have done anything for the world. That was never who I was. Mm-hmm. I was a human. So, you know, but a lot of those cries were not so genuine. I'm not saying not all. I, I definitely think there's definitely, I had some pretty scary moments there myself. But to cancel the fun of flirting and, you know, that you can't be feminine and you can't, or to cancel these films because, oh, they were overt, oh, sex. Exploitation. All these girls, you know, Linnea and these girls, they're still making yep. money. They're, they're still people loving them and loving them for who they are. And, and they're good people that do things on the side and that get, maintain their image. And I, I am very proud of them, as I'm proud of women, friends of mine in the stand up world that are still out there on the road. I mean, I couldn't do it, but they're doing it. Mm-hmm. And But it's, it's very frustrating to hear. I mean, you know, I did stand up for many years and headlines. I couldn't go on the road now and do the act that I did. Just because it was, you know, talking about being a woman and being flirty and sexy. They, they, they wouldn't tolerate it. I don't get it. Yeah. I hope that the pets swing so far 
in one direction that it comes back because it's really too much. As my husband and I say, it's just too much right now. I mean, I'm all for be ever who you want to be, but mm-hmm. that's just it. Be whoever you want to be. Don't don't take away who I am or, you know, or the love of loving these films, which are now classics, which you feel became guilty looking at because there's a whole world that's like, oh, those are not, those are bad. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah. Joe, Joe Bob has come back, and he's showing the fa- the famous horror films like Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Halloween and so forth, but he's not showing Hollywood Chainsaw Hookers anymore like he did 30 years ago. You know, I just, I think that's kind of interesting, you know, and I, I would like to see, you know, uh, those movies uh, being shown on, on, the, on the horror hosting shows again. I would love that. I swear, I wish that, you know, I, I could do that or get the, I mean, he's on, he's got, I know he's on the one that some sort of channel, but I couldn't, you know. There's a lot of filmmakers, these young filmmakers that are still doing these films. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, what's his name? Renor- Jim Renorski is still doing them, I think. Yeah. I think he's still out in Hollywood, still doing them with some of these same ladies, which I love. But there's also a lot of, a whole young generation, people like you that grew up loving these films that are still doing them. And we've, it, we've talked, we actually get our own little up all night for like a minute or two, you know, from out here. Mm-hmm. I should have done it longer. But anyway, we were using films like that, you know, young people that want to just, you know, just, I forgot if you want Roku. I think it was Roku. Mm-hmm. Um, we really should do that again because it's just kind of fun to do that with young people who just, you know, can't get to market or don't know how to get to market mm-hmm. or just even using clips from those films because it's really a shame not to be able to want things, you know. Yeah. The whole thing is like, be who you are, but it's really hypocritical because it's not really true. Yeah. Uh, and I, you know, look, even Bill Maher was in a B film back in the day. I mean, yeah. so many people got their start in these B films. As, as, and, I mean, great actors did. And, and to completely negate all that is really terrible. So I'm with you. And we can start something or, or you know, I don't know, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> let's get it out there. <laughs> Yeah, I, they, um, they, I would be happy to do up all night again. Yeah, even I, just ourselves. I mean, my team. I, I have a producer that grew up loving it too, and he's like, "Let's do it. Let's do up all night. Let's let's do one contest for young producers and directors and put their films up." And I'm like, "Hey, I, I would do it. I, I find more time in the day, but we could certainly do a little something, something that would honor that world." I mean, we did the B movie film awards on Up All Night, which was so cool. Yeah, <laughs> have all these people that were legendary directors. I did a film, you know, it was about sixteen years ago, I think, called The King. Uh, what was it? Prison of Go Go? Mm-hmm. It was a young filmmaker in Texas, and my, my husband and I lived in Dallas for a few minutes when we first got married, and he put he did this film on thirty five millimeter shorts. It was like amazing how he did it. You know, they don't do any of that stuff today, but. Um, it was so fun because he made fun of everything. He made fun of the shower scenes. He made fun of zombies. He had zombies in it. He had, um, not karate, what do you call it? You know, all the, like the karate movies, I guess. But mm-hmm. he had the, the, the hot girls. He had the prison scenes. I mean, it literally made fun ninjas. It made fun of everything. It, it was just such a fun film. And it was a fun, and, and who was in it was, um, trauma Lloyd Kaufman yeah and you know he they, he literally came after and I happened to be living in Dallas at the time he was perfect and he it was a union film it was Screen Actors Guild and I think the director went on to do other things in, in, the, in the industry but it was mm-hmm. it was refreshing to see someone making a film but back then still 16 years you could still do it yeah you no know? We, uh, we we recently lost Gilbert, and I know you and him were close. I know. And I'm I'm just so uh, sad because I looked forward to listening to his podcast every week, and now that I can't, I can only listen to the old ones. It's just devastating for me. So, oh my God, the shirt. I know I was devastated. Mm-hmm. Um, you know I, you know we come from friendly with his wife mainly over uh, you know emails and Facebook and back and forth, but you know she's lovely. And I told her, I said, you need to keep it up. She goes, no one wants to hear me. I said, get guest host. You know, get some of these guests. No one will be Gilbert, no. But, you know, she created the show, Dara. Mm-hmm. And she created the concept. So, I'm, I, you know, I told her she should. I, I noticed they, they are rerunning them. We did a really funny one in the early days. Yep. <laughs> it was dirty. It yep. was really dirty. 
And I led him down that path because I knew Gilbert well enough to lead him down the path. And let me talk about all the old dudes I dated and uh, red buttons. I didn't date him, but, you know, he starts doing imitations of all these people that I worked with. He was so funny. And he was so good to me. I, just, I did a little Facebook. I'm sure still doing it. It was called Wanda Share Social Hour. And we run it on Facebook. Yep, I, I watch it. Yeah. yeah, we in the beginning we did it live in the beginning of the pandemic. Um, I think he's been mainly doing clips and I keep threatening to go back live, and we will at some point. We just have been really busy, my husband and I. But yeah. um, but Gilbert came on that for me. I mean, he was just so giving. Anything I ever asked him for the years. And the gal, again, I'm referencing back to the gal I worked with and talked to yesterday. She was like, you and Gilbert had such great chemistry. I go, thank you for saying that, because we did. When we worked together on the few shows that we actually worked together, I kept hoping, why doesn't that USA Network <laughs> do a sitcom <laughs> with us? Like, we're really funny together. And it was all just natural banter. And I, I just loved him. I loved his intelligence. I loved working with him. I loved, you know, being playful and flirty with him. And I just thought we had a great, you know, rapport. And I, I, I was just devastated when I heard him pass. I, I knew I'd seen him perform in, in the Tampa area mm-hmm. a couple of years back, and he was great, but he looked frail. He looked yeah. frail. So I guess he had been suffering with this, but um, performing to his last moment, which is the way I know, you know. But I'm, I'm, I'm happy that he found Darren and has two lovely children. I think that's, and they're just adorable. His son looks just like him, and I think I'll carry on for his father. Because he was pretty open when one of those kids. Yeah. <laughs> Hearing him just everything. But, no, but that's what's cool as a parent. Yeah. You hide this stuff from your kids, it's bad. But when you're open, it, they, don't, they don't go looking for it. You know, like, it's very, you know, I'd love to hear what Joe Bob brings. I, I did his show. I was on his show, too, during, mm-hmm. you know, the pandemic or his podcast. And um, it's, it's just, it's really terrible, I feel. We all, all the horror hosts need to get together and have a big petition and get all the fans to sign it. And go to USA Network. I never could figure out why USA Network, I mean, not with me, but didn't, you know, bring something similar back. But, you know, they're all afraid now. Everybody's still so politically correct to, to go there. Yeah, oh my God. Now, you yourself got to be in some classic bad films, and I'd like to touch on some of them. <laughs> Um, I've talked to Bill Sachs about Galaxina. You know, he's an interesting guy. What was it oh, like? Wow. What was it like working with him? Oh my gosh! I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't even remember. That was literally <laughs> like the first thing I ever did in LA. I think it was after the Bob Hope special. Mm-hmm. And I just went back to my roots and did a robot because when I, I used to do this mechanical mind kind of modeling, yeah. and I used that a lot. That's why I said I always go back and do the things. And that's in my book, you know, the things that I grew up doing. It was kind of like Shields Me Are Now or that robotic kind of movement. And um, that's what I did. I played a robot in the film. But I can tell you this, I don't remember working with him. It was so many years ago and so yeah. long ago. But um, Dorothy Stratton yeah. was the same agency. And I was, that, the whole world, all of us, because we were all around the same age, were just mortified, terrorized when she was murdered by her husband. It was just, it, oh, it was just beyond heartbreaking for young. We were all in our early 20s. And she um, she was phenomenal. Like, I, mean, I went out to dinner with her a couple of times and my agent, and she was just, she was going to have a big career in front of her. She yeah. really could act. She was beautiful. I mean, she, had, she looked like no one else. She was just a beautiful woman. And I think she would, I think she truly would have broken away from Playboy and become a movie star. So... She, I remember well, but the film, you know, my one or two days on the set, I don't remember. I don't, I have, I haven't even looked at that film in so many years. Yeah. It. <laughs> yeah. The other ones I remember, I'm telling you, I was so focused on TV that I would do these parts in these films. And it would be like, eh, whatever. Yeah. So, uh, which is sad, which is so sad because I look back and go, oh my God, I could have had this amazing career in that world as well. And I, I, you know, it's just what you choose. I was so focused on stand-up and doing mm. the club scene and the improv and the comedy store. Um, Lloyd Kaufman, obviously my fondest memories are, are with him. Mm-hmm. Toxic events, because Hatoxy was always on air with us. And Lloyd would always pay us visits. And we promoted, and we, I mean, I, I really, I mean, he thanks us because Up All Night really did, or Up All Night really did promote and, and use his film. He was great because he was very giving to come on and 
use his talent, and we just, we just do great sketches with him. So yeah. like so many people have said, thanks for introducing me to the whole, you know, um, a trauma library, and he did really well. I, I, I think he's still out there doing stuff, but oh, yeah, yes. he did really well. You, you can't stop Lloyd Kaufman. He keeps going and going like the Energizer Bunny. <laughs> he is. He is. He and his wife and his kids are, are like very, you know, they're really, really smart and I forget, and accomplished. I think his son-in-law is famous chef. But he, I know he created something out there that's really um, kind of like an apron or something like that. I just thought it's something to do in the cooking food world. Yeah. But a um, very smart family. It's lovely. I mean, Lloyd is just Uncle Lloyd. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a huge fan of basic training and I just watched it for the first time in years recently. I didn't realize, you know, it was ahead of its time. It's kind of a, um, a kind of a pro feminist yeah. movie. It is. Yeah. I tried to tell that to someone though. It really was though. You're right. It truly was. Um, yeah. Angela Ames, bless her heart, was a really good friend of mine. So, I mean, she passed away early of, of a heart attack. Just, uh, and her mom had passed away really early. And so that was just devastating. Um, but the film was fun to make. And I could have st stuck with that. I mean, all those people that produced and directed, Andrew Sugarman, they're still out there. They're still doing things. But I was the one who just kind of pursued the other direction. And that was, that was, that it just opened so many doors for me, and I loved doing that film. And I don't remember. I loved working with everybody. Everybody was rather new. You know, Andrew was new. Um, Gil, I can't remember Gil's last name, who then went on to do, had a huge career himself. Um, oh my God, you would know his, his television show. You've got you to gotta Google. Yeah, let me look. Right now. Yeah, because he, he went on to do amazing things on television, not in the sitcom world, but in the horror world. Um, oh, Gil Adler? Gil Adler. Yeah. Gil Adler. Gil Adler, who wanted to date me and marry me, but I was, that time I was a fool because his career <laughs> is huge. I did that a lot, though. <laughs> <laughs> I had a crush on the director, and the director was married. That was stupid. I should have gone with Gil. I mean, there were all babies in it, but they all went off and did um, a lot of great things. So, and, yeah, and, That was the first film we ever ran on Up All Night, and that was... You know, I said, hey, I, I did this film, you all have to run it, and they did. So that was, that was fun. And Dusenberry was coming off of Jaws 2 and Cutter's Way, which are mainstream movies. Was was she comfortable doing a movie like this, you think? She was. She was lovely. And it's funny that, you know, I think we're all the same age, but she was, she, she was like the more experienced one because she had done films and this she went on and did you know, the last uh, um, series, not series, yeah, the last series of Lucille Ball. Oh, okay. I, was like, I, I, was, I mean, it was short-lived. I don't know how many they did. Maybe six. I don't know if they got to 13, but I was like, that's so cool. Um, she was lovely. And, you know, I Googled her and tried to reach out to her, and she's never really responded to She's on Facebook. Yeah. But um, she still does theater. Mm. And from what I see, and she looks amazing. I mean, she's got her hair. You know, she's happily a gray-haired lady, white-haired, yep. and looks beautiful. But I think she still does theater, from what I can see. But you know, completely got out of the film business, which I, which I get. I understand. I mean, I have friends that are still out there auditioning, and then I have, you know, I look at Renee and the girls. They've survived. I feel better than anybody else. But they stayed really close to their fans. That you know, it's something I should have done again. This mother should have, would have, could have. Is that you know, I was invited to some of the early film festivals, and you know, the, the not pre Comic Con, mm. and I went to a few, but not enough. And I feel like I got separated from my fans, although still to this day, I get fan mail every day and I get requests for podcasts. So it's almost like there's a resurgence. And then, so, I mean, if I get asked to do any of these conventions, you know, I won't say coming out of COVID, but I guess we have to live with it. Um, I would be happy. I would be happy to do that now. I think it would be really cool. They sh they, yeah, yeah, they, they should book you. Great. Just great. They should book you for conventions. Yeah, I don't know why they haven't reached out to you yet, but I'm sure, you know, the more podcasts you do, then you will get people uh, asking you to them. Right. Yeah. And I think that's what it is. I think it was, you know, Elvira and Sandra stayed with it. You know, it's just that I ended up, you know, reuniting with my husband, and then we started a new business because we had to make money. <laughs> 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 Everybody goes, what was your business plan? You guys are so successful. I'm like, survival. And I thought the intimate apparel business was really interesting because I spent so much time in intimates on, on USA Network and it certainly worked there. 
And then a friend had given me a tip that, um, you know, Bad Home Shopping Network, they were looking for someone to fill in that dead space that no one was selling insurance apparel. So we reached out to them, not knowing any mm-hmm. other than my husband was a successful businessman, so we understood the business part. And they gave us a chance, and, we, it, and it took off. I mean, it took off meaning that they liked me and they sold out, but then we had to learn the industry. We had, I mean, meaning that how to manufacture and how to get product. And so, I mean, we started literally at ground zero. And the book talks about that. That's why I'm also proud of the, the Up All Night book, because it talks about business and starting off and giving people tips of wanting to get into any business and, you know, how we did it. And we, we just did it, one foot in the other and kept reinvesting. We didn't have a bank. We had nothing, no help from parents. I mean, we literally just did it on our own. So, um, so anyway, I was just, you know, I wanted to have a life. Um, I didn't want to always keep knocking on doors for show business. I mean, I hit, mm-hmm. when I hit 40, I thought it was over. <laughs> Unlike <laughs> you know, J-Lo, who says when you're in the 50s, then I'm like, wow. I mean, I looked great when I'm in the 50s, and I thought, not bad now. But <laughs> these girls, you know, I, I thought, you know, everybody put in my head, 40 in L.A. was like, you're dead. No way. So that was in my head, so I started thinking, well, I've never been married. And my husband reached out to me through classmates.com kind of around that same time. And nice. I, was, I, I wasn't looking to marry my first kiss, but um, he charmed me once again, second time around, and we did get married. But then we had to, you know, he was living in Louisiana and I was living in L.A. And we had to make a plan of living together and he, he, his business through, through divorce and everything just wasn't going as well as it when he started it. So we just decided to completely start over. And we did. And, um, oh, that's sweet. Is a, yeah, but we but one foot in front of the other. I mean, we didn't know it, but now, wow, it's it's been twenty years later, and uh, it's been wildly successful. And we continue to keep doing and reimagining and creating new lines off of the longest year line, which is awesome. And but you know, like I just did a part in a film. There's a film that was being filmed here called The Throwback, and it's it's going to have I an love that title. for at least it'll be sold. Somewhere, on, on a, I mean, it's, it's a good film. It's with Will, um, what's his name, Sosa? So, 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 so. I can't remember the name. Like, and, and just Justina Machada mm-hmm. and uh, Bobby Lee. And uh, a love Bobby Lee. <laughs> He's in it, and then a couple of young stars, and they are just the young stars are going to just be huge. They're they're Disney people, and they're like beautiful people, but. Um, and Justine Archana, it was lovely. I, I didn't know her or of her because I'm just, I don't watch as much television as I did. Mm-hmm. But she was lovely to work with. Anyway, it was done here, and I had this fun, fun role of a boss lady cougar. And it was just so perfect. It was just like, it was just like my character had grown up. But not, not bimboy or light voice, but, you know, I, I ran an, um, an advertising agency that the lead worked yeah. for. But I have the eyes for his younger peer in the office. So it's just a little bit of Rhonda from Up All Night, but, you know, but boss lady. And yeah. I have an agent now, and they're always telling me, I like, just submit a new picture to them. They're like, we love you, and we'll submit you for roles. Like, there's so many boss lady roles, and they're out here. Just get new pictures. So I did. And now I can't wait to get the new footage, to, you know, so I can show them. So, yeah, my once your foot is in the, the showbiz door, I don't think you ever can get it out completely. Mm-hmm. It was just a love. Um, and a friend of mine who produces big comedy shows, he lives in this town, I live in St. Petersburg, Florida, and he lives here, and he does some really big shows, and he just said that he's starting to produce some, some big stand-up shows, bringing some big names in, and what I want to host those. And he says, you got to dust off your material and bring it back out. So I said, okay. You know, mm-hmm. I'm, just, I, I, I'm just at the place now, if it comes to me, I'm doing it. I'm just not going to you know, go knocking on every door now. I, I couldn't yeah. do what I did back in the day because my life was so focused. And that's why I didn't marry or, or look left or right. It was just focused every day on getting work. I didn't want my parents to have, you know, wasted, you know, getting me through college or, you know, helping me with my rent my first few years in L.A. to be for naught. So I never, I always treated the business as you should, like a business. And so there was never a day that I didn't go to work, whether it be in my home or sending out pictures, resumes, knocking on doors. I mean, so when I when you ask me about, you know, I go back into the books, and you know, my when I look at my books and see the activity that I had, even 
you know, just getting going when I first moved there. It just blows me away. I'm like, wow, I was busy. I made myself work, like, all the time. Mm-hmm. And I took anything and everything. Mm-hmm. And so that so everybody goes, you have an really eclectic career with so much out there. I go, because I didn't have a family member. I didn't have anyone really to, to guide me. I mean, I had management. I, I did have some good management for a minute, but I kind of blew that, too, which you do a lot of stupid things when you're young. But um, I had Jerry Seinfeld's manager who loved me, but then my dad passed away and I kind of flipped out. I mean, got depressed and kind of just walked away for a year from the business and it just wasn't the same when I came back in 84. So things kind of changed. So I had lost the momentum of the work I was getting all the time. But, um, but, you know, it was all good. A bull night came along and changed my life for the better as well. So it was all good. But I took everything. You know, I was, yeah. if it was great paying great, and if it was low paying great, and if it was no paying great, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I was there. I had a great work ethic. I mean, some people would go, oh, you have to wait for that role. And no, if I'm not in front of people and I don't have family in the business, I have to get myself in front of people and I'm not sleeping around, which, sure, I could have done that, but that was not who I was or who I am. I, uh, it, must yeah. have, it must have been a huge highlight of your career to work with Mel Brooks on Spaceballs. It was great, because it was really fun. I mean, I wish I would have gotten, I read for the um, for the waitress. Day Young. <laughs> yeah, and he loved me as uh, for the waitress. And he, go, and, I, and he goes, I would so give you the waitress role, but you're not blonde. And I'm like, I'll wear a wig. I'll blind, <laughs> dye my hair. Well, I was going back and forth at that time anyway. And he was like, no, no, you show up on the set. I love you. We're going to find you something. And that's what he did. But, you know, he literally cast what I thought was so great. My friend who was a casting director at the time brought me in on that, a Disney casting director. And uh, But he literally auditioned every single role, mm-hmm. one line, just being there, being on the set like he had to see you physically. So I got a lot of my friends in that were stand-up comics, male friends, yeah. uh, that had one or two lines in it. And who ever thought or knew that that would become so iconic that when, like, I go to my hair salon, and the young ladies, they're young, they're in their early 20s, and they don't know me from up all night. Then they find me and they flip out, but they all know Married with Children, they know yeah. um, Full House, and they know uh, baseball. And, and that just blows them away. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's, they, they just love that. It just became such a classic. But why, you know? But that would be politically incorrect by today's standards as well. Yeah. You know, I mean, <laughs> I mean Mel Brooks made fun of every race, creed, and color, and as Joan Rivers did, and she was my idol. It was all done making fun of yourself. You know, at first, you know, that we used to be able to laugh at ourselves in this country in general a, a bit more than we can now, and and we can't, and it's so sad. I know. Yeah, I, I feel like humor is what got me through Hollywood. Humor is what kept guys from going in for the feel, feel up. <laughs> you know, it's like you, you crack a joke and guys, it doesn't make them so hot and bothered anymore. So, I mean, that literally got me through so many, so many hard times in my life was using levity, humor, and comedy. And now, I, I don't know what if I was out there on the road. I don't, it would be terrifying. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm kind of, I mean, not, it, it's worse in the last two or three years or four years or whatever, but I used to speak, I mean, I guess it's been several years now, three years maybe, I used to speak in front of a lot of universities or being an entrepreneur, just in front of a lot of groups right. of entrepreneurs, but I would sit in front of college kids and, and I'd be saying really funny things, and I would look out to these blank faces because they're so used to staring at their phones or so used to, you know, just being on the computer, and I'm like, I would actually stop and go, you know what I just said was really funny. And I would look at someone just like I was doing a stand-up crowd, and I'd point out, like, hey, you, or whatever, you know, whoever, a young lady. Or, and, yeah. and then I'd start engaging them personally. When I started engaging them and they felt like it was okay to laugh, then they started to laugh and smile. But they didn't know what I was saying was funny or they were afraid to laugh. And it, it's like, wow. We're making a generation of really bitter, angry people because they're so used to communicating via text that they don't know the sound. Like I send text to my office, you know, people at my office. We have to, you know, like twenty-something people at the office and more at the climbing store, and they'll think I'm serious about it. I mean, my my best employees in terms of they've been with me the longest, and I'm like, 
you can't read that I'm just nagging at you. I mean, <laughs> you're not getting fired. I'm nagging at you. No, you can't read it because it's in a text, so you can't hear my voice. So I, you know, I have to put LOL after everything. So, um, true. The people just don't, I feel like you must have lost, and that's, that's very sad. And that's what those films were. It was so tongue-in-cheek, all of it. I mean, look at the, you know, uh, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. I mean, look at the names of these films. Yeah. <laughs> and I know I was in Rollerblade 7 or whatever that was. Yeah. I, what's the name of the director? He was well. Oh, Don, Donald G. Jackson. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. I, I know all. He was lovely, and I probably would have been more if I would have just stayed close to him. Yeah, do you have any good stories about him? I don't know stories about him. I don't know stories about, you know, that many people in that industry. I know it's, it's wild, right? Yeah. <laughs> know probably more than me with Gilbert. Because Gilbert was truly a B. Mm -hmm. He was a fan of a lot of genre. He was yeah. all the old. Uh, all, well, you, you listen to his podcast. He loved old stars. He loved, Same here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he he, yeah, he was a lo he loved the films. I mean, he you know he loved comics. Uh, I mean, he was he, he was just one of these people who had random thoughts. Yeah. So his um <laughs> his co-host Frank. Uh, I can't even. Uh, Frank Sando. Frank Sando Padre. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was the reason why they got along. Is he had that same he had the same love of like you know all these like really random people and thoughts and and was the perfect co-host. Well, that's why I tell Gal you got him. I know it's not the same. You can't replace Gil, but, you know, people love that podcast and, yeah. and bringing out these legends. I mean, but no one else is going to do it if you don't do it. You know, I... I, I yeah. Just, so I don't know where she is about it. I mean, I know she was still grieving, but she didn't want to let Bill's memory die and that he did something he really loved doing. Like she said, he loved doing that more than anything. It was just a thrill of his life. What, what year did you start doing stand-up? I started in... 85 or 6, I think 86, 85 or 86, probably 86. Well, 84 and 85, I was doing stand-up with um, a, a comedian named Kenny Ellis, who I met in Harvey Lembeck's, uh, look him up, look up Harvey Lembeck. Oh, yeah, Harvey Lembeck. the improv king. <laughs> yes, well, I worked with Harvey himself, and I, and I met this, you know, kid. Who's my age exactly? Mm. And we worked together, so we started play. He was kind of sticky, like cat still sticky, you know. Mm. I, and I love that, but you know, it wasn't current. But we we did a lot of shows together in classic places that just don't even exist in Hollywood anymore. Um, but we, you know, and I did the mannequin thing. I would do the mannequin thing, and then we would do these bits, and I would do different characters. And he reminds me, and this is, I forget this. And then he reminds me that, and I don't even know how, and this might have been to George Shapiro, that we got an audition for um, Saturday Night Live and, together. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to go to New York, because that was very me. I, I, turned out, I would turn down a lot of things just because I didn't feel like doing things. Yeah. Or I was scared, I was scared to fly, or what, I was really terrified to fly back then. And he goes, can you believe that, you, that we turned down an audition for Saturday Night I said, you know, even if you wouldn't have gotten it, the experience would have been amazing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't believe it. I have to go find that in my, in my, in my, um, in my, I think that's why I'm afraid to look in my diaries and my, mm -hmm. in my Facebook because I'll find things and go, wow, I can't believe I didn't do that. I got cast in a really big film that filmed it, that was filming in Barcelona. It was mainstream and I had a lead in it. I can't tell you that much about it because I've wiped it out of my head. Yeah. But I didn't go because I was scared to fly to Barcelona, so I backed out. So there was a lot of moments in my career that were self-induced. And then there was moments like when Henry Winkler fired me off, Happy Days, that yeah. was, he was a joke. <laughs> 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 and I can't stand him because he hurt a young girl, and all because I went off to do a commercial on Thursday before the Friday shooting, mm -hmm. and I had gotten commercials from Jerry, from, um, Jerry Paris, right. who was the director, and Jerry Marshall. I got yeah. permission from them, but I didn't ask Henry because I would think that the people who were the producers and directors were the bigger people to ask. And I and I remember I was very young, and I said I got this commercial, and commercials pay well. I'm a young lady, you know, paying my own rent. And they're like, oh, we use you all the time. Yeah, please go do that. This is just a, you know, you only have a couple of scenes with Henry, and you know the show, you know the set. Yeah, go do it. 
And then I showed up on Friday, and Henry purposely didn't have anyone call me the night before to tell me that I wasn't in the show. And I showed up, and they're like, hmm, you have to report to Henry's dressing room. And I did. It wasn't sexy yeah. at all. It was the opposite. And he said, look, I'm going to teach you a lesson. I learned the same lesson when I was in college. And I chose something over the play I was in. And I'm going to do the same thing with you, because if you want to act, you have to be serious about it. I said, I am serious about it. I'm so sorry. I had this clear, and I'm crying. I'm, like, crying. And um, he still proceeded to, you know, hire an extra on the set, fire me, and he claims, you know, someone reached out to him when the book came out, and they actually reached out to him to find out if that was true, and he said, I didn't have the power to let her go. The producers did that, and I'm like, no, 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 no. You did it, because you know, he was a big star. It was the last season of the show. Right. And uh, what that did, and one of the things I really read, and I didn't think about this until years later when I'm married to my husband, is, that they blackballed me from Laverne and Shirley and and three and not three company, um, Laverne and Shirley and Mark and Mindy and all of Gary Marshall's shows, which was a huge, huge um, brand back then. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until years later that the same casting director who loved me, um, Bobby, I can't remember his name, right there, Bobby, Bobby, Bobby. I know he cast a ton of stuff. Mm-hmm. And then he, he called me in for other shows later after Happy Days was off the air, but I, I, I literally lost years before he, you know, not nah, he wasn't going to catch much of a town, but yeah. he was like a whole, you know, all the shows that Gary Marshall produced at that time was, was devastating. Yeah, that is just... Henry. And I don't bad mouth anyone. He's the only one I'll bad mouth in the industry because to do that, I love helping young people. Yeah. I love, love, love helping young people. I use, I still help young models and anybody I can and put them, I put all the girls on up all night because they needed footage. They just needed air time. So I would put them on. But, I mean, to do that to someone when they're 22 years old, I don't know. That is, that's awful. Really awful. Um, do you have any upcoming projects you'd like to mention? Well, other than the throwback, it comes comes out next year mm-hmm. um, sometime. And, um, of course, always HSN.com and RogerShear.com and then the book up all, up all night. And um, you can also, if you want to buy a great gift on us to marry or not, or for anybody special in your life, you can go to retreatstpete.com. And um, that's my consignment store, which is fabulous. And also, I will be doing some comedy shows, and I'm looking to do more acting, so get the word out there. I loved being on the set, doing this character. Mm-hmm. It's a great character. It's fun. And um, I imagine I'll be doing more of that. I mean, I have, I have the word out, even to a local, not local, but out of Orlando, a, lo- um, a, a cat, not a casting director, an, an agent that casts everything that comes through Florida. So, um, I'm, I, you may see me, who knows? <laughs> and you and I are going to get together, and we are going to petition and get up all night back, or up all night back on the air. <laughs> yes, we need to do that, because th- there's no way that the world, sh- and, and this generation should not know about that show. It was just the best ever, you know, it just... Yeah. Love it. You know, yeah. young kids of today, if they were unbiased and not weighed by peers, and they looked at these shows in the way you guys did, you know, they would love it. They would love it, and they would learn to laugh again, and they would learn to laugh at themselves, and it's okay to have humor. And um, and truly, that's what's missing. And this is why I think we're so separated and divided as a country. Yeah, I mean, we're so like following each other and everybody's got to get a million tattoos and everybody's got to do this and hey just go do your own thing that's what i loved about acting and, and being in la is that everybody was, was more of a loving community to each other at least back then yeah um i have uh, anyway I, let's I, do it we'll take over yes we gotta do that i have a joke for you yeah what do you call a <laughs> what do you call a boy that doesn't masturbate other than frustrated, I was going to say my husband. No, no, that would be. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. I don't know who, what. A liar. <laughs> now, now I'm giving my husband the stink eye. <laughs> the stink eye. <laughs> yeah, I'm giving him the dirty look because he's smiling right now. <laughs> oh, and he's laughing. And we've been married 21 years. That's oh, oh my God, Rod! I gotta tell you real quick. I, I love that joke you had in your stand-up. Uh, you thought Macho Peter was Nacho Eater. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, 
telling you, I'm going to get some of those. I'm going to dust off some of those, my old jokes and then start writing some new stories so that I can so I can go do my friend's MC. Because I think it'd be really fun for me. I love doing stand up, and I did it for a long time. And yeah. it's just you know, when I start getting more involved on the air here, and it just ends most of my time and I'm not putting it down it's fabulous to be able to help women and feel better about themselves and have a great you know great brand and line after my name but it beats up so much time that I can't do some of the fun things so um, you gotta make that happen it's all it's all up to you oh your <laughs> your your book up your book up all night is available on Amazon your website www.rondashear.com as well as your lingerie and uh, the Rhonda Shear social hour is on YouTube yes thank you and, and Rhonda Shear TV on YouTube and, and the book is back on Amazon it's a little while it was down and I am getting ready to record that for audio as well just it's just, it just I just need more time in the day this is why there's no retirement in sight. So I may be coming to a, uh, a TV screen near you soon. It's my age of You can catch me on there oh, most every week. So check it out. I, I, I thank you, uh, Tommy, so much. Oh, Rhonda, I can't tell you what a tremendous honor this has been. Thank you for fil- f- f- fulfilling my sh- my shallow male fantasies over the last 30 years. And you are a credit. I hope I got, I hope I got you through puberty and that that joke was aimed at you early on. Because I got many a young boy through puberty. <laughs> you did. You did. And you, you are a credit to the Jewish people. I, I look forward to reading your book. Thank you so much and have That's a great good. day and be That's safe. Good. Thank you, honey. Thank you so much. It was fun. Talk to you soon. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Rhonda Shear. Ain't she a sweetheart? Oh, my God. One of the best interviews. She is so friggin' awesome. I'm so glad we got to talk today. Thank you, Marie, her assistant, for setting this up. <sighs> well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying... There's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.